demand was derived demand, demand for the products, the goods and services caused the demand for the labor. And we use the, I use the example of hats. So if there was an increase in demand for hats, then there's an increase in demand for the people who make hats. We also talked about how if there was an increase in aggregate demand, an increase in total demand in an economy, then you would expect to see an increase in the demand for the people who manufacture the goods and services. Same basic idea. We talked about the productivity of labor and how that might impact on the demand for labor. The cost of labor, how that might impact on the cost of, of sorry, on the demand for labor. And then we had a look at the curve itself. And one of the things that we said is that they tend to hire people who are the most productive first. They are the people who also receive the highest wages. And as you see, as we employ more and more and more and more people, we tend to employ them all right, but we can't necessarily afford to pay them the higher wages. Okay, so you're going to expect that the later people to be hired potentially are the ones that may not have as many skills. All right, they might be, you know, less productive. Okay, all right, but if wages start to increase, then employers are going to decrease the quantities that they demand. Okay, they're going to maybe move to machines. And if you've seen some factories nowadays, you'll see that actually happening. And we talked about that. We talked about how a number of businesses make that decision between labor and capital and become capital intensive as opposed to labor intensive. We talked about the supply of labor being us. And that supply of labor was about the people of working age, the people who are both willing and able to work. All right. Um, if you, uh, yeah, so dependent on the age, of course, all right, uh, and that idea of willing. So, are you actually willing, and then are you able to work? All right, we said that was going to be influenced, and it was going to be influenced by whether there was an unemployment benefit available to people. Okay, and if there was, then they might choose to not work and still earn that income, or if there was, but it wasn't very high and they still needed to work. Okay, you get this sort of idea. We talked about changing social climates, the idea that um, as society has evolved, we've moved from the 1940s and 1950s where women tended to work more at home to now the modern workforce where women do work in the workplace. Yes, we've still got a wee way to go in, in many parts of the world with regards to gender balance within the workforce. Right? And I mentioned about the United States and how difficult it seemed for them to even consider electing a woman as president. And it was only just this year that they've gained a vice president as a woman. Right. Uh, geographical mobility, we talked about the ability to move different countries, how able are the workers to move between different countries, and occupational mobility, the ability to change between jobs or potentially within the same job doing different tasks. All of that's about the supply of labor. And then you can get statistics. And we talked about the labor force participation rate, the percentage of labor of individuals within the working age population who are working rather than unemployed. And we talked about what might influence that participation rate. We looked at the supply curve, there it is. And we talked about how as a general rule, right, if the wages rise, we're gonna supply more of our labor. But we did suggest that more modern economics suggests that maybe, and it's a maybe, as the wage reaches a certain point, people start to say, no, that's too many hours worked. I'd like to have less time, more leisure time, right? time with friends and family and less time at work. So it doesn't matter what the wage, they're going to reduce the quantity of hours that they work. We also discussed, and this was a really significant point, the idea of elasticity and how it impacted on the supply of labor, right? Where there were lower skilled workers potentially having more elastic a supply curve. Then we could talk about more high skilled or more productive workers having a more inelastic supply of labor curve. The impact that then had on the labor market, it creates essentially smaller labor markets within each industry maybe okay and the smaller the market right so the the smaller the supply okay the smaller the market so if there's only one individual then it's a very small market for that one individual 
and it's potentially perfectly inelastic based around that one individual who's supplying their skills. We talked about how there could be uh, people who were in one particular occupation. So what have we got there? Cleaners, maybe the skill level might be considered to be lower um, than the brain surgeon. So therefore the elastic su supply uh, might lead to them having lower wages. Yeah. Now that's based, obviously this is all based on a market-based economy. When we talked all the way at the start about command-based economies, one of the things that we mentioned was that the government would be deciding the wages, right? The government would be making the wages potentially equal across all jobs. So whether you were the brain surgeon or the cleaner, you'd actually be earning the same amount of money. Now, again, if you're going to critique a model and you're gonna be saying, well, I don't know about that command-based economy, maybe that's one of the criticisms you could add is that that doesn't allow for a lot of incentive for you to want to be a brain surgeon if you're earning exactly the same as the cleaner. We talked about why those differences might turn up. It might be the skilled versus unskilled, the experience versus the inexperienced, the qualifications, the gender perhaps, tied maybe to some discrimination, uh, public sector versus private sector, and the difference between different industries and different industrial sectors, so technology versus farming. And we mentioned, as said, the idea of special skills, special talents, making you unique. Now, before we get to, yeah, so this is that idea about special skills and special talents. And, and I use the idea about Michael Jordan, okay, because he is a player who I, well, I like. Right. And in the NBA, he was the first player to ever sign a contract over 20 million US dollars. Right. And that's pretty outstanding. And the fact was it actually exceeded 30 million dollars in a season. Right. Which meant that he was earning over 30 million dollars for one NBA season, a one year contract. And that is the most any player has actually ever earned for a contract for just a one-year contract at the time. Um, I don't know about now. It may have changed a bit now. All right. Now, I've put my little person in here, and I can't actually read the bottom there, but that's all right. Okay. It probably tells you how much it's worth in today's dollars. So $30 million in 1997. All right. Uh, in context, that's going to be worth however many million today. I might actually get rid of him. That's okay. So there is, if you like, the model for that idea of an exclusive skill. The idea that one individual potentially is so productive that they have a perfectly inelastic supply curve. Right? The Steph Currys, the LeBron Jameses, the Michael Jordans, um, that's just the basketball players. Think about the movie stars, the rock musicians. Um, there's a really interesting economics study that we... Um, I can't remember, it came out, didn't come out that long ago, and it was talking about the contribution to the South Korean economy of the music group BTS. And apparently they contribute an awful lot through their ticket sales and various other things that they do in merchandising, etc. Uh, contribute a huge amount to the South Korean economy. So the idea is one individual, or in that case one group, um, can earn a lot of wages, income, based on the idea that they are perfectly inelastic. Now, dum, 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 let's take it one step further. How about, because we're concerned that some people might not be earning as big a wage, um, you know, maybe they can't afford to live. Food on the, on the table, right? You, don't, you want food on the table rather than on the floor, but, you know, food on the table, right? So maybe we might have what's called a minimum wage, a legally restricted wage, a price floor for wages, so that employers are not legally allowed to drop the wages below that amount. Now, if that happens, that's going to be very similar to what we looked at when we looked at price floors in an actual market. We're going to end up with, here we go, an increase in the quantity of labor supply because the wage is going to be higher than the equilibrium wage and it's not going to be allowed to go lower. It will lead to a decrease in the quantity of labor demanded. We see that because the, 
the wage will be higher, it will cost businesses more, so therefore they will decrease the quantities of labor that they demand. So therefore you're going to get a gap, like we saw in a normal market when there was a price floor, you're going to get a gap between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. That gap will in this case be a surplus, but it's going to be a surplus of workers. So therefore we're going to be making unemployment, we're going to create unemployment by having a national minimum wage. So who's actually going to be unemployed? Well, again, if we go back to that model and we have a think about who it was that we employed first, we tended to employ the most productive worker first. We tended to employ the worker that was the most skilled, the most qualified, and then we started employing other people. So the ones who are going to be at the last, at that end there, the ones who are going to be the least productive, the least skilled, the least qualified, they're potentially going to be the ones who will be made unemployed by this particular policy. So it's one of those unusual situations where it's a good idea, it is, but it's actually potentially could hurt the very people that you're trying to help. How do we model it? Like that. Dum, dum, dum. What's going to happen? Let's have a think. There's the national minimum wage. It's a price floor. So as we said, when we looked at normal markets, it is set above the equilibrium. We can see here, look, quantity demanded of workers has decreased because they're more expensive. They're down to here. Quantity supplied of workers has increased. They're up to here. So there is your gap. Okay. Surplus of workers unemployed as a result of the minimum wage. And if we were to increase the minimum wage, yeah, well, have a think about it. We increase that level, then there's going to be even more people potentially unemployed. It's going to cost more for employers to pay that increase in minimum wage. However, however, there will be workers who will receive a higher income. So they might demand more goods and services, and therefore there might be more jobs needed because they're demanding, they're demanding more goods and services. So it's going to be one of those situations in the exam where you're asked, you know, what will, uh, should the government increase the minimum wage? Right? And you need to say po points both for, right? so these are points for and points against. Yeah. So there is your entire answer to an eight mark question about whether the government should increase the minimum wage. Now, remember, this is being discussed right now in America. There is a law about increasing being discussed about increasing the minimum wage to 15 US dollars per hour. So it is currently being discussed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'll just move one on. All right, now I've got a, an activity for you, which should have appeared. There it is. All right, now you should still see this. This will have appeared in the classroom around right about now. And I'm calling it the IGCAC Economic Shared Learning Application Wages and the National Minimum Wage. Now, I'm using the code NMW for national minimum wage. In other words, minimum wage. All right. Now, all I'm wanting you to do here, okay, is to find the wages of three different jobs, and you're going to write the job in there, and then what the wage is. Okay. Now, the only challenge that you're going to have with that particular task is, and it could be a sticky one, let's see, is that your jobs that you choose have to be different from everybody else's. Well, there you go. So as soon as, because you've all got the same document, so as soon as you see somebody putting one up, if you've put it up first, then it's yours. But if somebody else puts it up, they're not allowed. All right? Now, then the next column is for you to find the national minimum wage of a particular country. You can choose. Might be Malaysia, might be Pakistan, might be Uzbekistan, might be New Zealand, whichever country you like. And there's, you know, there's a couple hundred of them, so you shouldn't have too much trouble finding one. All right. 
and see if you can find it. Now, again, the trick will be for your country to not be the same as someone else's. So as soon as someone else picks this particular country, whatever that country is, you're not allowed it. All right. So stop and sharing, jumping back to the meat. That's the plan. Oh, hello, Lancelot. Good to see you. I was worried you weren't here. How are you? Good. Thinking you hopefully are there because uh, I saw your name. Now, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, that's what I'm wanting you to do. Okay. Uh, it is an application of the concept. Now, it shouldn't take you a huge length of time. I'm not aiming for it to take you a huge length of time. It is using the ideas we've been learning, applying them, putting them into a real life context, which is what the examiner wants. But it's also showing understanding of what the concept is, applying it to a real life setting. But also the challenge for you to, is to pick a real life setting that is different from everybody else's. But everybody will have the examples there, so you will also be able to see what everybody else is doing. Are there any particular questions? And what I want you to do? I'm going to take that as a no. Now, here's what you need to do. You need to fill in that activity. You can review the key concepts and ideas, work on the activity, get that one completed. If there are previous activities that you haven't thus far finished, then yes, that would be good to work on as well. Now, you've got a five-day holiday coming up, and I'm not expecting you necessarily to do schoolwork during that, but if you have got a spare five minutes when you're not, you know, lying on the couch or watching Netflix or going out for a run, um, yeah, have a, have a bit of a review of the key concepts. Just keep them ticking over in your head so that you know what they are, so that when we come back after the five-day break, then it's not, oh, what does that mean again? All right? Look at the language, look at the terminology. What do the words mean? How might I apply them? All right now, I'm obviously available over email. Okay, so if you do have any particular questions you can ask. I don't, I didn't think it would take you any longer than this lesson to actually answer those tasks. But if it does, then, then you can spend some time early next week if you need to, um, to have a go at that. Okay. Otherwise, as we'd say in the land of my birth, you can have the time now. Hey, Kornera. And if you need my help and assistance, please email me. Otherwise, the recording from the lesson will pop up as soon as it processes. Have a great day. And nice holiday. Thank you, Mr. David. Thank you, Mr. David. Thank you. See you. Thank you, Mr. David. Thank you. See you. Thank you, Mr. David. Hey. Thank you. Um, is the so for the wa as for the wages part where we put the jobs and their wage? Yes. Does it That's the idea? Does it have to be from like a specific country or no? It can be anywhere. Oh, anywhere. Yep. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, Mr. David. Yeah. <laughs> you forgot my name on the dock. Oh, is your name not there? Yeah. Oh. oh. Um, are you you're able to edit it though, aren't you? Yeah. Can do I just add my name? Yeah, just add your name. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. <laughs> I'm really sorry. No worries. No worries. Okay. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye.